Well, you know, what was what, and there was another really interesting abstract that did not, for some reason, make it to an oral session, but was a, a poster, and it was from uh, Denmark, where the, the, there was a patient treated with um, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes that had been expanded ex vivo and administered to the patient, uh, I believe, with melanoma, and the patient had a wonderful anti-tumor response, but ultimately the tumor grew out. And the investigators did an N of one study with all the limitations associated with that, where they compared some of the genetics of the tumors at the baseline and then the genetics of the tumors that grew out. And they were assuming they were going to see something like a loss of antigen or expression of PDL1 or some kind of genetic or epigenetic mechanism that would have been what you might have expected. And what they found, surprisingly and I think tellingly, were defects in antigen uh, presentation pathways, mutations or loss of expression of, of critical proteins that are required for the tumor antigens to be ferried up to the cell surface and presented to the immune system for, for review. And I think it gives us an idea of what the diversity and complexity uh, uh, of resistance is going to be, and we're going to have to figure out strategies to be able to to look for that prospectively and, and then disable some of those, those escape routes through other means. An interesting abstract uh, with the pembrolizumab data was, uh, that was presented in poster format mm -hmm. looked at initial tumor mass mm -hmm. as a predictor of response. And there were some indications that higher tumor mass at, uh, at initiation of treatment was going to lead to a lower response rate. So what does that tell us? Is that the thing that we go forward with? Probably not. It's a combination mm -hmm. of all. But possibly those are the patients that may need a combinatorial. If you look at the combination ipilimumab nivolumab data, mm -hmm. and when they looked back at PDL1 staining, and this was interesting in comparison to what everyone else had presented. True, PDL1 negatives had a uh, were less and had a lower response rate to sequential therapy than the PDL1 positives. But when you looked at combination therapy, mm -hmm. their response rates were equivalent. So that, as, that leads me to another question. This is for you, but for anybody else in the panel. So why does the combination work? You know, what do you think is happening for the, because com com it seems to me that down the road, we're always going to want to use the most active treatment strategies for our patients, right? And while we may have to be cautious on the road, ultimately that's where we want to be with these effective combination strategies. But, you know, and to, quite honestly, those of us who have been in oncology for a while still can't really explain why any drugs that, that are used in combination truly work together, right? But here, we, since we are doing a form of targeted therapy, it seems important. So why do you think that um, uh, this combination of blocking a PDL1 axis and blocking CTLA4 is, is actually See, seeming to demonstrate such dramatic improvements in outcome compared with monotherapy. You know, I, I guess yeah, at a right. very simplistic level, since we don't really truly understand mechanisms, it's the redundancy of the system, mm -hmm. and we're inhibiting broader ranges of resistance as an initial therapy. I mean, again, it's simplistic, but it, it clearly is at least part of the story since we don't understand the downstream mechanisms of resistance. Absolutely true. Jeff, Jeff Weber has uh, presented some data in, in other meetings where if you're giving uh, PD-1 antibody, mm -hmm. the cell surface expression of CTLA-4 goes up. Mm -hmm. So it's a you know, redundant pathways that you have to bl dual block. So I've heard it hypothesized by some individuals, though, that there may be an additional mechanism, which is <clears throat> more... Um, about the kinetics of T cell infiltration of tumors, meaning that the PDL1 or PD1 blockade will obviously allow T cells to stay activated when they get close to the tumor cell, and the CTLA4 is essentially, um, ex by expanding the, the, the T cell pool, is favoring T cell infiltration into the tumor, where it can no longer be inactivated by PDL1 in the tumor. Do you think that that has a relevant mechanism? That would be my, my guess, you know, because if you look at some of the data, the CTLA-4 is more in effect for the T cell when it's in the lymph node, you know, in, in its early phases. And um, we've shown actually at, at Yale and some of our studies looking at 
you know, lung tumors, melanoma, that it's not enough just to have the PDL1 expression. You also have to have the tail cells as well. So, so it, it clearly is, is the combination of the two. So I, I think that's a very good explanation. Roy, you're turning into an immunologist. It's proof that the field is really moving forward. Or, I, or I'm at a, a good institution where, at, where, where you can't help but learn from a few lectures. <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, that's really good. I think we, it'd be a good opportunity to move on to some of the other drugs. If you want to tell us about your, your perspective on the different PD-1 and PDL one targeting agents a little bit and whether you think there's any particular distinctive a a properties at this point of any of those to the use of treating um, uh, melanoma? Well, I, I think at this point what we've seen is that the, the PD-1 antibodies have a broad response, that patient profiles are different, uh, the response rates are coming to similarity, uh, so it's more of, there is no clear difference. Now with the anti-PDL1 targeted agents, mm -hmm. the response rates have been lower. Mm -hmm. Clearly we need to figure out if response rate is important or just disease control rate. Mm -hmm. um, Jed Walchuk's clinical cancer research paper and the idea of immune-related uh, response showed that patients getting stability and patients uh, having response have similar survival benefits. Uh, at this point, the going forward, I cannot say that one is better than the other. Um, we are doing randomized studies, but we've moved on from single agent mm -hmm. in, in clinical trials. While we're still trying to find out what is happening for the biomarkers, and while these drugs are going forward for approval, uh, the idea is that they are all, they all have benefit, that they will all move on to some form of combinatorial, looking for higher response rates, more durable benefits. Mm -hmm. Now, an idea that's uh, out there is that the PDL1 antibodies may have a lower incidence of toxicity, and primarily the pneumonitis. Mm -hmm. And that's just because when you block PD1, you're blocking its interactions with uh, PDL1 and PDL2. And PDL2 is important for homeostasis in normal tissues and in the lung. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the question of whether toxicity is less with this type of PDL1 targeted agent in patients who mm -hmm. have possibly a higher incidence or a higher risk of pneumonitis is one that mm -hmm. I think is important. Those patients who've had radiation to the lung or previous lung injury, um, et cetera, mm -hmm. and we'll find that out going so, forward. 